Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is sweet mashed Kentucky straight bourbon and rye whiskey made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. Who the hell was like, we're just going to let some grain sit out. Yeah, they're fermenting. Then we're going to heat them up and only let some vapor go. We're going to let some drop down and then come back up and then run through this and then we're going to drink it. We're like, drink it. <laughs> like, who wants to try it? This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in bourbon news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. You know, when we typically talk about building a distillery, we usually think of things like the stills, the mash tank, and where to store all the grain. But building a distillery is no different than building a house. To make all this stuff work, you need electricity, plumbing, and pumps. Well, in the case of a distillery, Lots and lots and lots of pumps. But even before you begin breaking ground or rehabbing that old abandoned distillery, a lot of this has to be planned out. And this is one topic that we've never covered on the podcast previously, and that's how the heck do you actually build a working distillery? So that's why we invited Nick Morgan and Ronnie Florlich to be on the show. They are mechanical and distillery engineers from Shrout Tate Wilson Engineering, and they have the experience on how to design and build a distillery from the ground up. They specialize in being a one-stop shop that will guide you through the entire process of making sure you have all the guts needed to turn on the lights, but also specialize in working with companies like Vendome to create the best still and all the distillation equipment to meet your needs. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Eric Weller, who writes me on... Wait a minute. This guy's last name is Weller? All right, now... Okay, what's going on here? Is this this the guy hoarding all the Weller in the world? I need to know about this Eric fella. I have a feeling he's got a bunch of cash strength Weller and 107 and special reserve in his basement. Anyway, so Eric writes me on fredminnick.com. How long does bourbon keep after opening? I have a bottle of Blanton's my daughter gifted me for on her wedding day and would like to just drink it on the year of our anniversary. Will it keep after several years? What will happen to the flavor profile? I also drink Weller, hence the last name. Okay, all right. So uh, now we know that uh, Eric Weller here is the one buying up all the Weller in his respective area. So the answer is yes, uh, whiskey keeps just fine. Uh, There's a couple issues that you need to pay very close attention to. One is the closure. You want to make sure that cork is completely shut. You want to make sure that it's it stays wet so it doesn't dry out. So every now and then you want to go and like, you know, turn it over, you know, so there's a little moisture there, but it's also, you know, not too much. So you don't want the whiskey hitting it 24-7. You just want to like turn it over a little bit, like maybe do that every quarter or so. You also want to keep it out of the sunlight. So if, you, if sunlight touches whiskey while it's aging, I mean, that's bad news. And you want to keep it away from things that have like, uh, you know, thinner than air kind of fumes. Keep it away from gas. Keep it away from, um, this is going to sound like a no brainer, but I mean, look, as a whiskey hunter, like I've been to basements that the whiskey was stored next to litter boxes, like cat litter boxes. And let me tell you that shit gets in the whiskey. I don't know how it gets in the whiskey, but the funk, the grossness, it gets in the whiskey and if, if I see a bottle next to a litter box, I just go on. I leave. Uh, also, you got to protect it from yourself and your family 
because it's hard to let a bottle last for a year, especially one that's delicious. So that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you are like Eric hoarding all the Weller Weller, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button and shoot me your idea. If I like it, I'll read it on the air. Until next week, cheers. Barrel Bourbon has a single barrel program with rotating stocks of bourbon, rye, and rum. Talk to your local retailer about picking your very own barrel. Learn more at BarrelBourbon.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Mr. Ryan Cecil here today. Hey, hey. Talking about a new subject that we have never done on the show before. We've talked to, I don't know, how many, pretty much every major distiller We've talked to all the big dogs. We've talked to a lot of a lot of small dogs too, and we talk. You know, we've had Vendome on the show. We talk about stills. We talk about everything that happens from visitor centers, but we never talked about where do you start? Is at the very beginning. Like, how do you even build a distillery and and all the systems that make a, a toilet flush? <laughs> yeah, when, when you because you go on the tour and they're they're happy to show you, you know. This is where our mill is, and this is where our grain is, and this is where our fermentation tanks that are special are. And then, <laughs> they're uh, always the special. Yeah, they're always tanks. special. And then it goes over here and there. And what they skip over in gloss cellar is all the internal guts and moving pipes and pieces. And it's like a cardiovascular system almost inside <laughs> of a building. You're like looking around, and but you never get to hear about that. And so, uh, yeah, I'm excited about today because... The unsung heroes of, of yeah. the industry. All their work stuck up in a ceiling or behind a wall, <laughs> behind a wall you know, yeah. but it's very crucial to make it all work. So, yeah, true. I mean, this is, like I said, it's going to be exciting to talk about this only because I don't think, you know, I know we've never tackled anything like this. And this is also going to be out of our realm. But I know that there are audience members out there that are either in construction or they are mechanical engineers and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is all part of something that. We have to think about, but typically it's one of those things that's just like people that are thinking about it, they're two steps ahead, but people like us, we're two steps behind and we're like, oh yeah, we want it to look like this, but oh, how are you going to get the water over there? Well, we didn't really think about that part yet. But I guess that's, you know, that means they did a job well done because everything's working, all systems go and you don't even notice it. So that's, uh, mechanical engineers have done their work. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by the the pumps, you know, I'm a, I'm a pump guy. I don't know. Maybe it's because I spray lawns and I have little tiny pumps, but I'm, I'm fascinated by how much transfer and all that That's stuff true. goes on. Especially when you think about other distilleries where they have, or just, you know, should I say any distillery where they have a blending tank and it's got, you know, 5,000 gallons in it. And they're like, all right, time to take it over bottling, which is like a quarter mile away. Like, how do you get that shit over there? Strong right? Strong ass pump. I know. <laughs> so we'll be able to get some of those answers today. And I'm really looking forward to it. So today on the show, we have two guys here from Shrout, Tate and Wilson, MEP consulting engineers. So we have Nick Morgan. He's a mechanical engineer. And we have Ronnie Flurledge. He's a mechanical and distillery engineer. So guys, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks yeah. for having us. Pleasure. I bet you never thought you'd be doing a podcast, doing an engineer, being an engineer. Uh, you nope. would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> They don't teach you that. <laughs> Not much. No. Nope. So uh, Nick, I'll, I'll start with you real quick. So I said MEP, y'all shortened it to say like MEP. Like what's the, <laughs> what's the industry way of, of saying this? <laughs> yeah, sadly, our, our industry is just loaded with three letter ac acronyms that we always joke about. But MEP is mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Fire protection is also tied into that. And basically it's, you know, we're the consulting engineers that, of any building that you can set eyes on. These systems are somewhere behind the walls and somebody had to design those systems and, and put them into place to make the building function. Uh, and that's what we do. Traditionally, that's, you know, for the last 40 years that our firm has been in existence, that's our role. And uh, and so this is kind of a sort of new, but, uh, you know, we can get into that a little bit later about how we evolved into the distillation process. But uh, yeah, MEP engineers. Is that all new construction or do you do rehabs or? No, it's it's no, renovations and renovations. new and uh, both have their own set of uh, challenges. But uh, of course, the renovations always seems like it's a more the the bigger challenge. But uh, yeah, we do both. So at what point did you all realize you have a knack for figuring out how distilleries work and getting that kind of business to figure out how we design systems for distilleries? So uh, maybe, uh, like I say, we've been in existence for, we're going on 40 years now, but about 20 years ago, we got introduced into our first, uh, like a visitor center and it happened to be Heaven Hill, I think was the first one uh, around 2000. 
And we were just there to basically help create the interactive visitors experience. And this was the old visitor center. It's just obviously been upgraded and replaced. But we were there to do the, you know, all the electrical infrastructure and mechanical and provide all those systems uh, for that, um, that owner. As a result, you know, we kept, you know, one led to another. You know, we did Heaven Hill and then we've, you know, been down the road and touched on basically every major distillery in the area. And it was always kind of from that visitor's aspect of, you know, this is what the interactive is going to see, the, the, the folks that come through on the tour, they're going to see these parts and pieces. And it was kind of, you know, the, the frilly sort of things behind the scenes, but also this is uh, the experience, you know, like the Evan Williams Bourbon Center experience down here in Louisville. We did that project as well. And all along, we thought, you know, what we're missing here is the distillation itself. You know, we, we would like to do that piece of it. We don't really have the expertise to know that, uh, that process. And by the way, to, to say that you wanted to do the distillation expertise, is that because you saw that, I mean, all these pipes, they've got to run to somewhere to actually feed the equipment. Right, right. And you're like, well, we can do it, but we're not sure what we're doing. Is that kind of the idea? Somewhat. Like before we always tasked to, to take it to a certain point within the process. And then a process engineer would pick that up and say, all right, now I got to take water, sanitary, you name it, to feed the actual distillation process. And so we wanted to say, well, we want to be able to offer that whole scope of services to our clients. But in-house, we didn't have that expertise right at the time. So I'd like to say about a year or so ago, we, uh, we got hooked up with Moonshine University here in town. And they have uh, you know, numerous classes that you can attend to learn more and more about, you name it. You know? And so the, the five owners, we attended their three-day course uh, to learn more about, you know, is this something we really want to get into? Do we want to try and find that person that can design this for us? It was about five minutes of day one that we all decided, oh, this is super cool. Yeah, we definitely want to do this. And so then it was just a matter of finding the right person. And fortunately, you know, the, the folks at Moonshine U are just fantastic. They've been a great resource for us. They came to us and said, you know, here's somebody they might be interested with. He's a former Vendome employee. Uh, and, you know, sitting to my right here, we ended up with Ronnie. And uh, he's been fantastic for us. So it's, it's been a, a really neat experience. Uh, we're excited where it's going. But uh, to be able to offer that, you know, full service now to our, our distillation clients. So it's good to know that Moonshine U is also in like the headhunter business. Yeah, no, no <laughs> kidding. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. And everybody we work with, they're just super helpful. And, you know, I think just in general, the camaraderie amongst the, the bourbon industry is just phenomenal. And just, you know, we see it all the time, you know, one uh, distillery helping another, you know, I need this part or this piece. And it's just, it's kind of unheard of in, in most industries really. So it's a great thing to be a part of. Yeah. Most of the time it's, it's animosity. It's like, well, just let them burn to the ground. <laughs> then, yeah. then we'll, then we'll Take own more. the, we'll own the pie after that. But right. yeah, you're right. It is, it is a bit different on this side. Yeah. So this is where Ronnie comes in the picture. So Ronnie, I kind of want to talk a little about your background, you know, as, as Nick had said, your, your ex Vendome. So kind of talk about, you know, a little bit about your past, your education, your history and working for Vendome as well. I'm a UofL grad. I went to UofL for my undergrad and grad. I did a mechanical engineering for undergrad and mechanical for, for grad school. While I was uh, doing my master's, I picked up a degree in environmental engineering as well. That really focused my master's on heat transfer and fluid mechanics and thermodynamics. And then when I got out, I wasn't doing any of that. I was designing big shredders for the plastics uh, recycling industry, which was very interesting, but it, it didn't use the part of my education that I really liked. I think we all find that when we graduate, you start <laughs> yeah. off with a job and you're just like, mm, well, I guess I'll kind of gut it out for here for a few years and figure out what's next. That's, that's what I did. I worked there for two years and, uh, then I started looking, um, and then I eventually found Vendome and that, that satisfied all of that. Distillery design is just all of that. He transferred thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and it, it was really a, a great way to expand and be a better engineer, which I really appreciated. So we, we've had Mike Sherman on the show before. So we've, we've, we've got to know the Vendome people. When the position opened at Vendome, what was the position for? What was it going to be doing? It was, uh, at, at the time they had one mechanical engineer in their engineering department. He did all their calculations, all their process, uh, a lot of their uh, mechanical stuff. He was kind of overwhelmed. You know? I mean, as you know, the bur bourbon industry has just boomed in, in the past few years. So uh, I went to them and, and said, here's what I can offer you. And, and they brought me on and, and that went really well. I, I learned a lot there and designed a lot of really cool stuff for just about everybody in the industry. So before we get into the really nerdy and really advanced stuff, kind of talk about the basics of, of designing a still in the process for anybody that's kind of a, a newbie listener out there that wants to learn more. Oh, designing a still. Uh, it's 
first you look at the process. First, you look at what you want to make and, and what you're starting with and what you want to distill to. You look at the heat transfer surface areas of, of the still and if they're relevant. Uh, you look at the the nozzle sizing, the the cross sectional uh, area of the of, of where the vapor path is. It, it's all kinds of stuff like that. Some of it's pretty standard. If you're doing about the same process on about the same beer still, the beer still just doesn't change all that much. Pot stills can change uh, depending on what you're doing with them, but that's it. It's that heat transfer design and, and fluid mechanics is is all of it. Would you prefer designing column or pot stills? Columns don't take, they're fairly standard. They don't take a lot of redesign between customers. You know, if, if one, one of these big guys is running a 36 inch beer still, the next guy running a 36 inch beer still, it, it's fairly similar unless you it's copy paste sort of thing. <laughs> not as easy as copy paste, but uh, a few people really customize them. Bardstown bourbon off the top of my head has a, has a real custom 36 inch beer still. They, uh, they've got giant rectangular sight ports that are real pretty and, and uh, stainless cladding. It's, it's, that's a unique one. Mm -hmm. So say you got like an existing, you know, still or set up and you're wanting to add or change or think what's more expensive, getting the still built or re reconfiguring all the, the stuff to make it work? Oh, I, I don't know that I've ever thought about it from that, <laughs> <laughs> from the, from that part of it. Uh, I'm not sure. Depends on what you're doing. Yeah, you know, if you're, if you're really building out a showpiece, then, then it might be the surroundings, the still, if you're not, if you're just building a workhorse, then it might just be the still and the, the equipment that supports that. And you worked at Vendome for how long again? Five years. Five years. Okay. So yeah, you got to touch uh, a lot of people, especially, you know, even recently, I mean, you, you were kind of in the, in the heyday when they were probably just like orders were coming in every single day for oh, yeah. a lot of this stuff. Not to say that they're not coming in now. Now I think it's like a two year wait to get it still from Vendome or something. That's but. actually a, a pretty common misconception that okay. it, it, I believe it had been up to two years for some things at one point. It has not been that much of a wait. Until you are. And how deep your pockets are. <laughs> yeah. pay, pay to play. Yeah. <laughs> if you're, if you're, you know, one of the giants and, and you get them on the phone, then get further you, you, up yeah, the, you're, the you're, pecking order just got changed a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Funny how that works. <laughs> I know. So, so let's start at the very beginning. So Ryan and I, we want to say we're going to start a pursuit distillery. It'll never happen, but <laughs> let's say we wanted to do that. Where is like the first thing we do? I mean, like, how do we pick out land, whether it's in Bardstown or Paris or Louisville or like, where do we even start? First thing is education. I would really look and, and see how, and try to evaluate what you know about what you want to do and then expand it from there. Trying to, trying to convince us not right, to build so a distillery. We, <laughs> <Is that> what <laughs> is? <laughs> so we want to roughly make about a thousand barrels a year and uh, end up bottling about 250,000 bottles a year. So take us to the promised land. Uh, first, I would get educated. I would maybe go to Moonshine University, something like that. Uh, next, I would get a distillery consultant. Yeah, but we got you here right now. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> I'll teach you. I teach, <laughs> at Moon, I teach at Moonshine University. I teach <laughs> no, the, uh, the uh, 102 section of the... Uh, six stick course which is basically the the hardcore part of the distillery that goes from the uh the beer well all the way to the receiving tanks so from finished beer in the beer well all the way to through to completed distillate in the receiving tanks i teach that section how to do that with both batch which is pot still systems and uh continuous systems which are the column stills okay, okay. all right so we need to look for a piece of land how big do we need to start just to look the next thing after you get educated would be to get your distillery consultant. And as you work through with your distillery consultant, one of the things that they're going to do is say for this production rate and, and what you want to make, here's all the equipment you're going to need, but also here's all the utility that you need to support that. So when you go shopping for your piece of property, you need to have all of that with you. So you know that you're not buying a piece of property that doesn't have adequate electrical service or sewer or water lines. So really coming in with all the correct information right up front, you can take that information and hand it to your, you know, the person who's helping you look for your property or your general contractor or your still manufacturer. It's it's great to have all the information right up front. When you talk about water, like is knowing like what your water pressure is going to be, like, is that actually like, how important is that? Your water pressure is not so much of a thing, but your water sources are definitely a thing. If you're going to be running all on city water, uh, there's tower water, which is used for cooling. There's chiller water, which is also used for cooling, but it's more expensive. If your property has an aquifer and you can draw out of that, out of a well and use that as cooling water, you can save a, a, a ton of money on that. And that's something that you can uh, look up based on the area. There's just all kinds of ways to, to do your water and save money on water. 
Can you do a lake or no? Yes. Is, you can? Yes. Okay. Plenty of people cool with a, a, with a lake. Um, when you say, explain cooling is what you say cooling. I mean, is that just like in the fermentation tanks, what's what the cooling coils? Like kind of talk about what that process is. There's several places in a distillery where cooling water is needed. Obviously you vaporize the distillate coming off of the still. It has to be condensed back into a liquid. There's the cooling water in the condenser. Uh, at the top of your column, you're going to have something called a deflamator. A deflamator is a uh, partial condenser that allows some vapor to pass, and it allows, uh, and, and it also uh, collapses lots of that vapor into liquid that has cooling water running through it. Your fermenters have coils that keep the mass beer a certain temperature. Uh, there's there's all kinds of places uh, that use cooling water in a distillery, and and you have to do it intelligently because it can be a, a great expense in a distillery. And so knowing the cooling water, does it have to go through a filtration process or like we can just take raw water and kind of just run it through here as long as it's not? Yeah, that's most of the time the, uh, the process is separated from the, the cooling water enough to where you can run lake water right up in the same heat exchanger. So we'll, we'll take, so for like a, a, a big mash cooler that you might find like at Heaven Hiller or something like that, they uh, would run mash on one side and, and straight lake water on the other. Okay. So, so like, say first, you got, we got, we got to find a lake, right? A lake. <laughs> so we got, we or got say a lake. We're, but say we're in the city and we, we don't have an option for a lake, you know, we're like Angel's Envy or somebody downtown or Old Forester, uh, but we got city water. Can we put in a separate meter, you know, to, to cool or. Oh, I like that. The separate meter. You know, cause like I'm thinking of an irrigation system, yeah. you know, at your house. Yeah. Cause you don't have to pay sewage on a, the water. They definitely do that. They definitely look at uh, when you build your distillery, you'll you'll need them to know how much is of that water is not going down the drain because you'll get charged for that okay. for sewage. Yeah. So uh, it's not that we would run a separate water meter. It's uh, the, the water is just intelligently used within the distillery. For example, if you wanted to make hot process water, you don't have to reject the heat from your condensers. You could run water through there at a slow enough rate to where it heats it up to the temperature you need and then take that hot water and put it right in your process. So there's, there's a lot of intelligent ways to do, do water in a distillery. First, I'm already saying I want a lake because, you know, A, we can have our, our boat on there, but then we can. And Mother Nature fills it back up. Yes. Instead of the city. Right? Yeah. Because uh, I think the, the whole idea of the aquifer is, is almost like you have to get lucky to yeah. find an aquifer on the land. And uh, Kentucky, there's quite a bit of well, well but, water, a lot, it, a lot of limestone, a lot of caves. And, and uh, so walk me through that. My I grandmother mean, has a still has a well not now the city was, water but but only until about five six years ago she lives in rural kentucky well, so. i guess anyway. we know where our distilleries can be built then yeah thank you electric Grandma's though seat. we might have to spend some money <laughs> some sewage but, but talk to me about like finding an aquifer i mean do you all help with that or is that like a city or a surveyor that helps figure out and you just start drilling until you find something can you speak to that because i've not run across that yes i'm not a geologist <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we're asking the wrong question yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would contact the state they would have records on that about where where the water was gotcha gotcha okay so now we kind of know where our we water got lands, we got water yep. we got the land got the water now the you had mentioned a good one is the electrical so how do you figure out how do we start running electrical from wherever until this thing needs to be and then how do you know much power we need to go into this building as well so the distillery engineer me would would design the process and that would tell you how much power that the distillery was going to use the MEP side of our company would uh, essentially the MEP designs between the the street, the power coming in from the street and the process. So I would design the process that would tell you how much power the building is going to use. The MEP would take the power and design that all the way from the street to the distillery itself. And we have a complete package. So for all the electrical engineers that are out there, and this is me because I am just, I have no freaking clue. Like how many kilowatts are we talking? Like, what is what is the wattage of what you would need to feed into, like I said, a small to medium sized distillery? You're speaking to two mechanical engineers, you realize. <laughs> yeah. okay. So we're going to get two different answers. Well, you said MEP. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Just off the top of my head, do you know a process load? I'm going to guess. I think I, I just did one recently for maybe 100 amps is what I said. So pretty small. The yeah, that was, a very, that was a very small distillery, but it, I mean, it can go anywhere. I mean, these yeah. distilleries are ranged wildly in size so okay yeah, yeah so it, it really that's another it depends sort of thing yeah yeah okay so now we've got i think the three main components so any other any components that i'm missing as of just like a, a land survey to figure out like where we're going to be building oh we, what, stillage stillage we'll definitely <laughs> stillage is a, is a big deal for distilleries stillage is the waste product that comes off of a still so in a pot still you fill it with 
beer, uh, you distill. So when you distill, you take uh, alcohol and congeners and water off of the top of the still that goes over the condenser. What is left in the pot is, is whole stillage that has to go somewhere. Uh, it, it's got a, it's got something called a high biological oxygen demand, which is hard for uh, sewage treatment plants to process. So they don't like you to put it down the drain. They want you to find someplace else to put it. Fortunately, it's very healthy for cows. Cows love to eat stillage and a healthy cow can go through about 30 gallons of whole stillage a day. So uh, these distilleries get these great partnerships where the, the, the farmer gets food for the cows and the distillery gets rid of that stillage. If you don't have an outlet for that stillage, it can shut a distillery down. It, sometimes it becomes the rate limiting component for an entire distillery to get rid of that stillage. You need to have a, a real robust plan. Yeah, I've, I've actually toured a distillery and they said, this is our, our stillage tank. And, you know, every day we have somebody that comes and, you know, picks it up for so, farmers and stuff like that. And they're like, and if he doesn't come, we can't distill. Right. Yeah. Right. It'll shut you down. Yeah. And it's not too bad, you know, in Kentucky, that's, you know, usually we can figure that out, but some of our clients are more, you know, tied to a city somewhere. And it's like, get me the farmer that comes to the, you know, San right. Diego to pick up my stillage and yeah. Pull find a, with a cow. So. Uh, that can be a problem. Absolutely. Or you just got to learn how to do urban farming or something. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just so, try to figure out how to get cows down the road and be like, come on, we're going to the distillery. It's time to eat. Yeah. Exactly. So who are you like, uh, I guess, who who is like your liaison or the main contact at a distillery that you're working side by side to like coordinate all this with? I typically work with the owner or their architect. So I'll, I'll work with the owner a, a lot of the times. Are they just like, you know, they're like us, we don't know what the hell we're talking about. And you're like, no, you can't do it that way. Or you can do, you know. Sometimes, sometimes they have uh, not much knowledge. Sometimes they're, they've got a pretty good plan when they meet me up. Uh, they don't always have a good distillery plan when they meet me. Sometimes they have a very good financial plan when they meet me. And then I come and fill in the rest of what they don't have. And you say, you're going to need at least 20% more. <laughs> not necessarily. No, no, Some just, are, it just because it just seems like anything you do. If you're good, life. you're trying to save them money, right? <laughs> yeah. But everything in life, it always seems like just add ten to twenty percent of what you think you're going to do. Yeah, with construction sure. for sure. All right, so I think we've so we've got four four things: stillage, we have our water, we have our land, we have our electrical. Is that what we need to kind of say like we're ready to start breaking ground on this thing? You also need your plan of. What to make and, and how much to make. But you, you already threw that out there, like, a, a, what, 100 barrels and of... No, we're going to do 1,000 a year. 1,000 so a year. Yeah. I don't know how... Then we're, we're, we're going to move to 100 barrels a day. That's all right. <laughs> our 100 barrels a day. And so that's 200 and, what, 50 working days. So, yeah. 250,000 barrels. We'll get Is there. Is that right? Man. I don't know. I'm not a math. We're not... We're, yeah, we don't have our calculators with We us. couldn't work for you all, so... <laughs> all right. So let's say it's, uh, it's time to break ground. We start getting all the, you know, all the equipment out there. We've got bobcats and everything's just you know ripping up the ground when we start building this i'm assuming everything is it's on concrete slabs like what's the what's the next phase in this process of building a distillery spirits of french lick pays tribute to the many distilleries that once dotted the southern hills of indiana they focus on using the best practices of those early times in balance with the improved methods of today delivering the finest handcrafted bottled and bond bourbons to an audience that's eager for an alternative to the big guys. Their distilling philosophy is balanced between the distiller's art and the contribution of the barrel, time, and patience to bring you an unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. Spirits of French Lick's motto is simple, respect the grain. You can find all Spirits of French Lick's products and their new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself and check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to always drink responsibly. Spread holiday cheer at Total Wine & More, a wonderland for every wine, spirits, and beer lover on your list, including you. Wrap up gift giving with top-notch bourbons for top-shelf collectors and pair it with a roasted duck for a jolly match. Uncork joy with a merry cabernet and meat under the mistletoe. And don't miss this year's top 20 wines handpicked by elves. Ring in the new year with their top bubbly picks. And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers, you'll find just the right bottle that'll look great in a bow. And at prices that feel like a present. Choose curbside pickup, in-store pickup, shipping, or delivery, and fill your sleigh in-store or at TotalWine.com. 
Spirit's not available in Virginia or North Carolina. The Heaven Hill Bourbon Experience underwent an expansion, renovation, and renaming as a culmination of a multi-year, $19 million investment in Kentucky's signature industry and a model for the future of tourism. The -the state-of-the-art visitor center is an interactive, educational space offering signature exhibits unique to the visitor center, including a You Do Bourbon Experience, where guests are guided through a tasting of unique products. And to commemorate your visit, you'll have the opportunity to bottle your favorite bourbon or whiskey through the custom-designed filling machines, and then you can apply the label and personalize it in the bottling room. To learn more about bourbon, Heaven Hill's history, and their award-winning portfolio, go to heavenhilldistillery.com slash booking to schedule a tour. Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. What's the next phase in this process of building a distillery? And where do you come in with the construction crews and saying like, okay, this is where all the MEP systems need to start running? So, so much of that happens, Kenny, you know, well before, you know, we dig a hole in the ground and start slinging hammers or anything. Uh, so the design effort is all coordinated typically with the architect, usually, you know, of course the owner, you need their input. Uh, a lot of it depends on, you know, is this strictly, is it just a, a, a distillery or is there like a visitor center component tied to it? And so much anymore, that's a big part of it. You know, that's what we see more and more people want to have that visitor experience and be able to, you know, take the public through areas that are in some cases kind of high hazard and you don't want them in some of these areas and hanging out around your fermenters and other places say, yeah, come dip your hand in the fermenter and give it a taste. <laughs> so there's all these, uh, you know, different questions to raise and, and, and answer. And so there's so much, you know, there's probably maybe six to nine months of, you know, engineering and architectural work on the front end of, you know, before we actually bid anything out to contractors to say, well, this is going to be your cost, you know, to build your, your facility. So, you know, kind of what we do on the MEP side and even on Ronnie on the process side that's all taking place well before you see the first contractor. So, and then sometimes, you know, there's different, there's different building methods and sometimes you'll have a contractor on board that's working with you to try and help save you costs along the way and say, you know, that's a, that's a great framing system or whatever, but I can do it out of concrete or whatever and and save you some money. And so it just all depends kind of on the owner and and the approach they take and, you know, what they're trying to achieve and what's the end result. So every time I walk on in a, you know, in a distillery and you hear like the steam and all those systems going, I'm like, dear God, I hope these engineers know what they're doing. <laughs> like I'd hate for something to burst and blow, you know, yeah. uh, right now. It's like, talk about like, you know, the difference of mechanical engineering from like the, you know, when you go in a distillery like Buffalo Trace, that's like, looks like it has been there since the early 1900s. And then yeah. you go into something new. What's some major things that have changed that, you know, they did back then that you would recommend now? From a process side or from like a... All of it. <laughs> <laughs> not not all of it. Yeah, from a... Bore you to death. You know, I, I guess a look up in Buffalo Trace, you know, you're seeing like steel pipes or, you know, like old pipes and right, this right. and that. And like what like material changes and this and that to, to make it more efficient now than versus back then, I guess. Yeah. So the bulk of that is tied, you know, what you're seeing, it's, you know, all the pipes hissing and whatnot and the steam coming out. That's all process related for the most part. You know, what we're seeing is Hey, put me in a comfortable space and uh, give me nice lighting and a visitor's experience. And but you know what you're seeing behind the scenes and, and some of those tours that you do, like you say Buffalo Trace, that's pretty much all process. You know, and you're walking by the the fermenters and uh, and and on down the line, that's all that's all Ronnie. So in terms of you know what would you say is the uh, big advancements or what have you seen over the years? Uh, let's see, big advancements in the distillery. Uh, the stills are, are are fairly static. They've they've been like they are for quite a while. Uh, there was the original uh, coffee still, which uh, also called the patent still, which uh, John Coffee invented in, in Ireland in 18 something. Uh, that still design is similar to what an American whiskey still is, is shaped like today, at least a column still. We were talking about that last, we were somewhere, I was like, who the hell was like, we're just going to let some grain sit out. Yeah, they're ferment. Then we're going to heat them up and only let some vapor go. We're going to let some drop down and then come back up. And then run through this, and then we're gonna drink it. We're like, drink it. <laughs> like, who wants to try it? Like, can, can, do you know the history history of that? Well, the, like, it's it's actually a logical progression to take it from. So I can I can do the whole history of history of stills. Sure. Get nerdy on it. Uh, yeah. There was this guy named Jeeber. He's widely considered to be the father of modern chemistry. He invented this little alambic pot still. He, he, that's where the word alambic comes from. He called it his. I'm going to butcher this alambic or something like that. 
and that was the pot still and, and where it came from. Now, if you take a pot still and you pipe it into another pot still, the vapor, the vapor line, I mean, that vapor will go into that next pot still. It will condense in the liquid. It will give up its heat and boil that. Commonly in moonshine, that's called a thumper. Well, say you did that again and again and again and again and over and over and over. Each one of those is another distillation. Now, instead of using pots and piping one vapor pipe into the next, stack them on top of each other. And instead of using a pipe, use perforations. Now that vapor that's boiling off that pot goes up and condenses into the next pot, goes up and condenses into the next pot. Okay. That's similar to how a modern beer still works. There's subsequent distillations on trays as the vapor moves up the pot. That vapor moves up and a liquid stream created by either the beer heater or the deflamator, that's called reflux. That liquid stream moves down the column. As that liquid stream moves down the column, it becomes enriched with water. As the vapor stream moves up the column, it becomes enriched with ethanol. That causes that great degree of separation that we're looking for there. Is that geeky do you feel sm- do you feel smarter? <laughs> I do. Yeah. I'm still like, who the hell figured that out? <laughs> right. John Coffey. It's John Coffey. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. It's like, yeah, you look at like, you're like, all right, Kenny, you try this first batch off this yeah, off you, the you, coffee still. You, you know? drink it. Let me know. Let me know how it goes. You know, <laughs> it's like, so so how many years from that coffee still to now to today? Where how how much timeline are we looking at? Oh, I don't. Was he 18? 70s maybe I, I don't remember his exact time but you know up until probably prohibition those you know once uh, around prohibition i think that the american whiskey still was already fairly uh kind of standardized designed or, yeah, yeah. yeah i got gotcha. you yeah and then that got crushed and then you know more modern versions are out now but they're they're still in structure very similar very to similar what they are yeah all right, so you're gonna you're gonna distillery consult us some more here. So, uh, you know, we had, we had mentioned we would do a, a thousand barrels a year. I mean, you break it down. What that's 250 working days. What's that? Five to ten barrels a day, something like I'm that. Terrible at math. Terrible. Yes, at that math. sounds right. But anyway, yeah, five to ten. It, it's a good good range there. Kind of talk us through as a consultant. How many fermentation tanks are we gonna need to be able to provide that much uh, to our our beer still to then go ahead and start creating whiskey for us. So what I would typically do is, is start off with a plan where you, that starts off with a minimum value that you'll want to run and then look at years one through five and then maximum rate. You can put all your fermenters in the day you, you start, but lots of people don't. They, you know, you might need four fermenters to run so many days a week. And then as you go and expand and expand your sales, you add fermenters as you go. Add that second shift, you know. Add get second that. shifts. And that's yeah. true. I mean, we, we do see that pretty common within the industry is that you'll have all these, I mean, you'll go up to the raised level and you have the grates and you have the holes already cut out about like yeah. where these fermentators are going to go. Right. And they might have four a day, but they've got room for like 16 more. Yeah. 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 10, 13 is, is probably upper end of, that gives you a lot of flexibility to schedule those fermentations. Yeah. And so when you are scheduling fermentations and we say like, okay, well, we, we want our, we want our, do our, our, our rye mash bill, but we also want to do a weeded mash bill. When I say stuff like that, does that start moving some cogs in your head to think, okay, well, we're going to have to, you know, change the way that, you know, it's like a, like a railroad track. Like how do you, how do you switch going from one to the other here? Typically you do about one fermenter a shift. So if you want to run 24 hours a day and say you're running just a bourbon recipe, you would just run 24 hours a day and not shut that beer still down at all. When I, when it's a, you say it's a continuous system, it can run continuously until eventually you need to uh, shut it down and and clean it up. Uh, Fats will build up in it where the beer touches and uh, you'll have to uh, clean that out with a little caustic and saponify that and, and knock it out of there. But other than that, you can run it continuously. If you were running a rye or a weeded, what you would do would would be to just shut that down, shut the system down, switch over to your other fermenter and just run that one and be done with it. Do you have to do anything with the still or is it like, eh, it's okay, like there's just a little bit of back set in there and we'll just, it'll it'll disappear when once we start taking our heads and tails or whatever it is. Between those two, you would just start the still up on uh, running water. You would just run water through it and once it got to a steady state and, and hit its parameters, you would switch it over to beer and, and run that. And when you say switch it over, I mean, is there like, is there like a magic lever, but it's like, pull the lever. Like we're switching, <laughs> we're switching over. Like what, what's that, what's that actual thing look like? Literally a valve. It's if a you, valve. Yep. Actuators. 
I, I want to talk pumps. I talked about <laughs> my fascination with pumps. Like, so like what's a standard like gallon per minute pump like that you're, you're trying to say move from you're, you're draining the fermentation tank to pump it up into your still. It depends on what it is. Uh, beer still. So say I have a thousand gallons <laughs> of fermentation tank. I'm running through our uh, column still. That's about say 30 yards away. <laughs> so what you would do is uh, for the pump pressure, you would look at, it's engineers calculate something called pressure drop for, for lines and pieces of equipment. Sure. Each piece of equipment that you pump mash or water or anything through has a certain back pressure that it would, will put on that pump. There's also back pressure caused by raising the, a liquid from a lower place to a higher place. So if you're pumping straight up, there's that pressure. There's uh, major losses, which are the, the friction with inside the pipe. Sure. There's minor losses, which, which are going through uh, little fixtures and making turns and transitioning from uh, a small tube to a large area or back. Uh, there's all kinds of little uh, minor losses. So there's major, there's minor, there's head losses, there's uh, equipment back pressure, and, and you add all of those up and that's how you determine your pump size. Do you advise like people like, all right, let's let mother nature work with this, like with gravity, you know, to try to like gravity fill these, you know, where we're not having to invest in so much pumping or use so much or is it more or less just, no, we got to make it work around the building? Uh, you lay it out and see what you need. All right. Pump talk over. <laughs> no, keep, <laughs> keep going with the pumps. I mean, because that, that is, like I said at the very beginning of the show, I said it's, it is amazing when you have like a, a holding tank that has 5,000 gallons and you've got to get that over to the bottling line and that's a quarter mile away. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's not where the, in my mind, in a distillery, that's not where the pumping gets really aggressive. Uh, if you look at, at some of these guys with these great big mash coolers, that mash has to be pumped through, oh, say, 20 banks that are 40 feet long. And each one of those tubes might be an inch and a quarter in diameter. So you can picture the, the, the kind of pressure that, that pumping yeah. fairly viscous mash through those tubes. It's like, it's like moving maple syrup instead of water. So what, so what are the tubes now that you're transferring material? Is it just like plex or pvc or not plex but was it hex pex or lots of times it's stainless stainless it, gotcha in, in the the tubes that i was just talking about in a mash cooler that that heat transfer surface area would would generally be stainless yeah so i'm assuming stainless you're you can run those for life really right yeah yeah um you the only thing you have to watch out with stainless and, and it wouldn't come up right there would be a. Uh, You'll see mick every once in a while um, um, there's some microbial can contaminations can attack stainless steel the other thing is uh you have to be careful with chlorine-based chemicals. Bleach and stuff like that can also uh, attack and destroy uh, stainless. So if you had a vessel that you put bleach in and, and left it there, it, it might cause cracking in that area. So word to the wise, if you're out there, do not, do not use bleach during distillery shutdown to clean off anything. So they use so. mostly steam, right? To clean their, is that what you recommend? Steam and caustic. What's really, caustic? It's a, just a, a, a basic solution that will like uh, saponify things that are in fermenters and beer stills and, and pot stills and, and clean them out. But steam is the other one for, for, uh, for sanitation in modern distilleries. No that's magic thing, erasers. That's another thing that I would mention <laughs> with the, a, a major difference in modern distilleries or, or, or something that's, that's changed is that the sanitation and the quality of the surface of the stainless and, and all that has added up. And really, you don't have to do certain things to make sure that your fermentation stay sterile. For example, you don't have to uh, always use back set, which is uh, a sour mash process. If you take some of that that waste that comes off the still and add it back into your process, it, it helps mitigate the microbial contamination by lowering the pH. In modern distillers, you don't have to do that so much just because of the, the steam sanitation and the quality of the stainless equipment. I always thought it was just like part of the ritual and the process of bourbon. Like, yeah, we just, we always do sour mash. I mean, I know there's other distilleries like Wilderness Trail that pride themselves on sweet yeah. mash, but I didn't really know it was just like a, oh, it's just, we're old, you're new. Like, this is just how it has to work. Yeah. So that makes me think, I don't know, when you talk about modern cleaning techniques versus old and we're, I'm a huge dusty bourbon fan, so I love older whiskeys. And so do you think maybe that had something to do with it? Like the sanitation processes that like, because it kind of has this like funkier, like earthier, you know, flavors from the, you know, back in the day. Yeah, maybe uh, there's there's all kinds of places you need to, to look at for uh, sanitation in a distillery. And people are more aware of those now. Uh, things like dead legs. A dead leg is uh, when you're pumping mash from the cooker to the fermenter. If you've got a part of that pipe that juts off, 
mash could collect there and and if bacterial contamination gets there is that mash gets pumped past that spot it, it gets inoculated with that bacteria and that ends up affecting your yield it lowers your the amount of alcohol you're making per grain it, and it also can cause all kinds of odd flavors so yeah maybe that's the first time I've heard the word dead leg before. I know. In a, in a S- besides like knee in you and a, yeah. the thigh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With my elbow. Is, there, is there any other kind of industry terms that we don't know about that are pretty random like that? I mean. Oh, I'm sure. I just won't be able to pull them off the top of my head <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, so at this point, we, we kind of know exactly like how we're, how we're transferring everything over into the, into the still. And, and you also, like I said, you helped, I don't want to say design the still from the ground up, but you definitely create that sort of introduction and, and help with work with Vendome to create the still to spec of, of what the customer needs. Now, this is one thing I, I don't know about as much is, so we know the still, whether it's, you know, everybody's like, everybody's big on, you know, 36 inch continuous stills or anything like that. But how do you know how big or what the capacity of a, a doubler needs to be? So the, the most important thing about a doubler is that you get the heat transfer surface area, right? You need to have enough heat transfer surface area for to vaporize the entire liquid stream coming in or, or most of the liquid stream. So to what a doubler is, is a continuously run pot still that usually after a beer still, so the vapor will come off the top of the pot still, it'll go through the beer heater, it'll be partially condensed, then drop into the low wine condenser and be totally condensed. Then that distillate gets dropped into the doubler. It's going to be polished up one last time before it goes to the high wine condenser and then it's finished distillate as long as you get the heat transfer area correct on a doubler to where it can completely vaporize that incoming stream. That's the most important thing. The volume of it is, uh, just gives you more of a reaction time. Right. And, and I guess the one thing we didn't talk about that you have a, a big background is the tail box. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. We, need, we need to talk about that. So, uh, first explain to people what, a, what a tail box is and, and kind of like the design of what you see as well when you're walking through a distillery. So a tail box is a box of varying ornateness that lives after the condensers. It's ideally for proofing the, the distillate that's coming off your still. It's usually got a, a glass tube in it and you take a hydrometer and you float it in that tube and you, you can valve it off so where the, the liquid's nice and still and you can look and, and take readings off that. Those readings are required by the, uh, by the government to show how much alcohol you're producing so you can get taxed on it. They are sometimes very ornate. Uh, it, you know, the inside of your distillery is, on your distillery tour is is so important to the public's opinion of your of your distillery uh, that these companies love to put in these beautiful ornate tail boxes. And Vendom really liked to produce those too. You know, one of the one of the owners there, Rob Sherman, was uh, just an artist at heart. And and whenever one of these would come down the line, he would take a lot of interest in it and. Then, and usually give it to me and as in like he would sit there and like draw it out design it what it would look like and then he says go build it sometimes lots of the stuff that that we did together he would actually physically hand draw me a sketch and and then send it off to me i typically i typically took the uh ornate stuff at vendome because i was at the time the only one there doing 3d i believe they're currently making a push to do 3d though so i was doing 3d drafting there's is what i mean gotcha and before we kind of move on to the subject, because I know we had talked a little bit off where one time we went to lunch and uh, the probably the most ornate one you've done is for Wilderness Trail. Oh, yeah. So for anybody that I'm going to let you explain it because kind of what it looks like and then kind of talk about the the innards of it, too. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, it's easily the most complicated tail box in existence. Uh, it's got 500 parts total, 400 parts in the clockwork. Uh, it was designed after a YouTube video we saw of a a Lego model. I wish I knew the guy's name so I could give him credit, but it was, uh, it was Sisyphus pushing a boulder, you know, forever. Well, we took that and we turned it into somebody rolling a barrel forever. And, uh, it's driven by the, it was originally driven by the low wines and the high wines coming off the, the still and doubler. The, uh, I think currently it's driven by one or the other, and I don't know which I haven't, I haven't seen it's, it's piping lately, but yeah, it's real neat. The, the distillate pours over water wheels, it drives clockwork, and, and a little man walks and he, he pushes a, a, a little barrel. Cool. It is. So th- cool. now anybody that goes and you go to visit Wilderness Trail and you right, see, see that tail box. And you see the, you see the tail box, you know that Ronnie's the one that, that built it. So it's pretty amazing. I think it should get more press, but everything else that Wilderness Trail does is so impressive that it just falls in the shadow. <laughs> so that's for certain. That's what happens. All right. So we got, we're all up and running. Now we need to protect from fire. 
what are some things that like, all right, what are the things, codes, what are we, I know obviously we need a sprinkler, but talk about sure. just anything and everything we need to deter from our place blowing up. No, right, right. So obviously we're dealing with alcohol, so completely different hazard class. And uh, the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, has all these different uh, you know degrees of you're you know, light risk or you uh, or a hazard group uh, or an ordinary hazard group. Basically, everything around just about the distillation process itself is all high hazard group. And so, there's tons and tons of these different bio, uh, bubble diagrams within the code that we have to be aware of. And this is on the MEP side to identify. All right, within this area, it's high hazard group. Whatever you know, I could go on and on about it. But uh, it all depends on just basically the layout of your distillation process itself, where the tanks are, do you have open fermenters or they closed fermenters? And so basically based on all these different bubble diagrams and whatnot, you come up with these different areas. And then ultimately that goes to a, uh, a fire protection engineer, which actually is not us, uh, but that's a completely different license that comes into the game. And uh, he makes sure that the layout of his sprinkler system is able to provide that level of protection. But incidentally also within all those areas, everything has to be explosion proof. So if you ever get back into those areas, you know, when you look at like a regular light switch or a light fixture on the wall, they're massive. They're these real beefy things if you've ever noticed or not. And so those are explosion proof fixtures for obvious reasons. And we do, you know, we identify all those and, and specify all that equipment as well. You know, further down the, the line, once we get into like rick houses and that sort of thing, same sort of animal, it's a different, you know, level of classification and, and hazard that you need to protect too. So we, uh, you know, work with the uh, the owners and whatnot to determine what that level is. It's pretty much the same for all rickhouses. Uh, but then ultimately, that's a fire protection engineer or he's a contractor that will design it and lay out that system. Oftentimes, you're looking though, it's you probably have to have a fire pump just to meet those levels of of flow and pressure, and it gets uh, it gets pretty complicated. And not to mention, then you know, you bring insurance into the game, and they have their say in terms of what level of protection you need to have. So there's a whole bunch of different people that have a say on what that system need, needs to be, so. Yeah, we were just visiting up in Sagamore and they had this beautiful new like steel beam structure, but they had like spray. spray. I was like, oh, you got spray foam insulation. They're like, no, 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 that's like flame retardant. I was like, oh, duh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you yeah. know, is that something that's required like new for new or is it, or do you have to do that or, or is that just like? So much, I mean, gosh, you can drive all over Kentucky and you see some of these old rick houses and it's like, I, how is that legal? How's the thing even still standing? Yeah. You know, it's, it's things have evolved and, you know, new construction has come along and, and codes get more stringent and, or, Hey, somebody has a fire and we lost one. Look at the damage and, you know, what can become of this if we don't properly protect it. So you're pretty much forced to, you're, you're going to have a, a sprinkler system in a, you know, distillery for sure. And absolutely within a rick house. So, uh, it's just kind of, that's how we do things these days. Right. Well, I, we learned a ton today. Yep. All right. Y'all co-signing for our new distiller? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, again, thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. I mean, this was, like I said, we learned a ton because this is something that we have never tackled on the show before is, is just building a distillery from the ground up and, and what do you have to think about? And and knowing, yeah. knowing the story behind Wilderness Trails Tailbox is also another interesting little factoid with this as well. So Yeah. It's like when everything works, you take it for granted how it all works. Sure, <laughs> and right. so it's a uh, Kudos to you all, and uh, it's amazing. You know, the entire process is amazing, and the hand you have in it is pretty cool. Definitely is. So, uh, you know, Ronnie and Nick, if people want to know more about Shroud Tate Wilson, and they're like, hey, we wanted to design a distillery, we want to rehab a distillery, and how do they get in contact with you to be able to do sure. it? Sure. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, we're able to be found all over the internet. It's stweng.com. Uh, you can call any one of us, and if it's like a, a distillery question, we'll definitely put you in touch with Ronnie immediately. Uh, on the MEP side, we've got lots of folks, myself included, that can help you with the MEP side of things. So yeah, it's uh, feel free to contact us. And uh, we've uh, had a blast here today. Thank you all so much for having us. And uh, it's been an honor. So well, thank again, you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your education and your knowledge with our listeners. Because again, one thing that we've never tackled, or as Ryan said, you just take it for granted. You never really think about it. It's you know, you turn the light switch on. Now everybody on the tour is going to be staring at pipe. <laughs> <laughs> like, where does that go <laughs> to? Get to here? Yeah, give us a call. We'll be happy to explain it to you. There you yeah, go. So. so if you have any questions about all that, make sure you check out their website. And you can also check out our website, bourbonpursuit.com. And also follow us on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. But with that, cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. Toodles. <laughs>